reacting to external demands or instruction rather than in ways determined by his own interests and energies and power. He says we may admire what he does, but we despise what he is. For Humboldt, then, man is born to inquire and create. And when a man or a child chooses to inquire or create out of his own free choice, then he becomes in his own terms an artist rather than a tool of production or a well-trained parent. Hello and welcome to the 31st episode of the Diet Soap podcast entitled Surrender, Self, and Stormy Weather. This podcast is going out onto the World Wide Web on November 11th, 2009, and I'm Douglas Lane, the editor of Diet Soap, uh, the zine, and the host of this podcast. This week's interview is with Jason Horsley who is also known as Aeolus Cephas, and who was formerly the host of the Stormy Weather podcast, and who from there moved on to Shooting the Ghost, and then finally back into a revamped Stormy Weather, rearranged into a podcast called Warty Theorems. He's also the author of the book Matrix Warrior Being the One, and uh, I enjoyed talking to him. There are no sponsors to thank this week, and while there were a couple of emails, I think I'll save those for the end. If you want to email me, you can send your emails to douglane at dietsoap.org, or you can find me on Facebook. I'm the Douglas Lane in Portland, Oregon. I'll also point out, before we begin, that a portion of this interview with Jason was set to images for a YouTube video. If you Google a conversation about gurus, you're sure to find the seven-minute video version of this podcast. Alternatively, you can just keep listening. Uh, My conversation with Jason Horsley of the Warty Theorem Stormy Weather Podcast follows the Pixies. Jason Horsley, you are a longtime film reviewer, a novelist, a screenwriter, and the author of several nonfiction books, including The God Game, The Secret Life of Movies, and uh, Matrix Warrior being the one. You were um, once known by the alias uh, Aeolus Cephas, and you were the voice behind the Stormy Weather podcast. But after that, you created a podcast series that documented your search for the ghost of Sam Peckinpah, called Shooting the Ghost. Uh, and, um, that, that podcast really was more of a search for the reincarnation of Peckinpah's wild bunch of characters um, through the lives of real people. Um, and you're now the head guru at, uh, at SWETA, or the Stormy Weather Existential Detection Agency. SWETA is a group of men who ask the question, who are we, or uh, individually, who am I? The answer apparently is that the members of Sweta are the planets. One member might find that he is Mars, the other is Neptune, uh, the next Jupiter. The other answer is that the men of Sweta are all mama's boys, uh, men who were once boys and who were wounded by their mothers and who now have to deconstruct their current identity in order to heal and become real men. So that's my my bio for you, Jason. I wrote that right before I called. Uh, what do you think? Do you want to respond or correct me? It's a very interesting summary there, Doug. A lot of it I'm quite happy with. There are a few uh, technical errors. Uh, let me think. Uh, Scriptwriter, I've never 
uh, had a script made into a movie, so that's probably not te technically accurate. Um, God Game was not a book, but a series of short documentary films. Uh, the idea of a head guru is interesting, sort of a uh, tautology, isn't it? Because is there any other kind of guru? Uh, <clears throat> but I, I, I don't consider myself a guru in any shape or form. And I don't think that anyone else does. I have been called the anti-guru, which I'm okay with, I suppose. Um, as for being the head of Sweda, well, well, yeah, that is inevitable, really, seeing as I was the one who started it, and I seem to have the clearest idea of, of what it is, although I'm uh, finding more about that out every day and, in a sense, less as well, as in that I, I know less and less what it is the more I find out about what it is, if, if, that, if that's not a complete paradox. <laughs> Well, it, it is, but that's fitting, I suppose. Um, well, on the subject of being a guru, um, I didn't intend to start with with this, but I, I think I will. Uh, over the last couple of days, I've been reading about Osho uh, Rajneesh, um, who was uh, the head of the Rajneesh cult that at one point was located here in Oregon. Um, and the way I stumbled upon reading a book about him, the way I stumbled upon the book about him, was I checked out a book by Christopher Gray, and Christopher Gray was once a member of a radical art movement in France called the Situationist International, and I'm uh, a long-time, um, I don't know, fan, I guess, of that group. Uh, and so it was odd to me to find out that this Marxist artist had ended up a member of the Rajneesh cult and had written a book about it. So I, I read the book and, um, and I was, I thought it was uh, an interesting synchronicity. That I was reading that book right before I talked to you. One thing about, uh, Osho Rajneesh and, uh, other gurus, um, like maybe Krishna Murti, uh, was that he did, he also, uh, denied being, uh, a guru or being, uh, important, he, he he was only pointing to the moon. He was not. Uh, he was the finger pointing. He would say. Um, uh, meanwhile, he was driving around uh, a new Rolls Royce every week. Uh, so, uh, are you aware of all at all of the uh, Rajneesh cult and and? Uh, yes, I am. This is a very pertinent uh, subject, Doug, because uh, my stepfather. Uh, actually joined the Rajneesh cult when I was a teenager, when I was just post-adolescence, maybe 15, 14. And he went off to Oregon, and he spent some time there, and he came back wearing the the colors, you know, the colors of the sunset or whatever it is, uh, and, and with the um, the picture of Rajneesh, of Osho around his neck with the beads. And um, he was quite drastically changed, notably changed he, his movements were slower he had sort of glassy look in his eyes and uh, it, it, that at least was my perception of it anyway I later found out that the Rajneesh Foundation purportedly uh, drugged its food so that might have had something to do with his seemingly drugged condition when he returned um, but the thing is, is that, that that was my first experience of, of Rajneesh and even of that sort of thing and um, my stepfather was a seeker uh, and he'd spent many years in India and and uh, so this wasn't a total surprise that he went off and joined this cult and then came back um, but it was was definitely a negative imprint you might say at, at a fairly early age of those sorts of things and I'd already had a very negative conditioning from my real father about religion in general so I was very anti-religious as a boy and as a teenager, to the point that I was quite um, proactive about it. I would do everything I could to persuade my close friends to renounce God, and I was actually quite successful at it. Um, so, um, but what, yes, you're describing this was quite, it was quite um, to the point, really, because it, it reminded me of that, um, that, that, 
gurus often insist that they're not gurus and that merely strengthens the idea in their followers' minds that they really are. And so the way to really deflect any uh, slavish belief in my being a guru would probably be to say that I am a guru and to claim that people should follow me and do everything I say and then they would be uh, suitably distrustful of me. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a catch-22, if you it see what I mean. Tr- truly is, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, the the book by Christopher Gray uh, puts forward the idea that uh, a lot of what uh, Rajneesh Osho did uh, in Oregon specifically was designed to, uh, in fact, come across, make him come across as a charlatan in order to uh, stop people from worshipping him as a guru, that he was purposely making himself out to be a charlatan. Um, and that was what the Rolls Royces were about. That was what the ostentatious um, clothing that he wore and the gold that he wore were was about. That was one of the reasons why he didn't take much charge of the, the actual commune but let some people who were uh, disreputable have much more sway. Um, and I found it interesting that uh, this uh, you know Marxist revolutionary – uh, Christopher Gray uh, kind of ended up being very sympathetic to Rajneesh Osho, and and uh, there was definitely a sense that while he was critical of the overall project, that the that the core of the of uh, that philosophy was still something he held dear. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Because um, if uh, an individual was was fully surrendered or enlightened um, it, it's quite possible that all kinds of corruption would would gather around them and misrepresent them and they they would perhaps be perfectly okay with that because the surrendered being wouldn't be trying to do anything anyway and and as as you also point out that this is a, a quite a natural organic way to um, keep people away who aren't able to see through appearances so uh, we're all tr- distrustful of gurus anyway and so as soon as we see what we think of are the hallmarks of a cult uh, whether it's many wives or many Rolls Royces or what have you then that just confirms our suspicions and, and then we're able to dismiss it so then it's only the more discerning who are able to actually get through that to the core of the message and whether that's true of Rajneesh I, I don't know I'd have to say I'd be I'm, I, I can accept that about the Rolls Royces, but not so much about the armed guards. I think at that point I begin to think that even an enlightened being might draw the line there and with the drugged food also. I mean, if something totally corrupt is... How about the bioterror terror attack on uh, the Dalles, Oregon? I mean, that commune um, was trying to manipulate an election about zoning laws, and so uh, his right-hand man, who was actually a woman... Um, uh, purposely uh, caused a salmonella outbreak in the Dalles in order to get people. It was actually a test run. The goal was to, to keep people from the polls so that they could manipulate the election and change the zoning laws for their commune, which was zoned for just to be agricultural land. And uh, so, I mean, yeah, there was a lot of uh, very corrupt uh, machinations uh, around the Rajneesh cult. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 about that particular incident. Yeah, no, they had like underground, uh, an underground bunker full of Uzis and bioweapons. <laughs> so it was, uh, yeah. Well, it seems slightly to me, being a, a former paranoid that I am, that, that uh, the Rajis Foundation, uh, perhaps from the very start, but certainly at some point, was co opted to become a, a, a PSYOP, an intelligence operation, and that Rajneesh may have been unwitting or unwitting that he may personally have fallen into a guru trap which is that we have a genuine awakening experience and we 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 use it for ourselves that is possible so it's only a partial awakening but we take it for the whole thing and we rather than continue surrendering we 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 use that as a a place of personal empowerment and so although there's truth in it it, it becomes increasingly distorted because we've still managed to invest in it 
in a way that isn't clean. And, and so then that would allow an individual uh, who had invested in their own awakening, if you will, to be co-opted in that way and perhaps not even be aware of it. Right. Yeah. Um, well, let's take a step back and, and talk about um, paranoid awareness, your idea about paranoid awareness as a, as a tool uh, for spiritual awakening. Do you, do you want to uh, describe that to me? Well, well I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, go along with the term like spiritual awakening because I don't know what that is. Um, but as a, as a tool for self, self-knowledge, perhaps, would be closer to how I might see paranoid awareness. I think that, um, well, initially, it's a, a, a movement of consciousness, the individual to... Uh, begin to want to look at and acknowledge truths and realities in the external world, whether they be UFOs or alien abductions or whether they be uh, political assassinations or <clears throat> biological warfare or global conspiracies or Masonic sorcerers or any number of other things that are happening in the world. And so then the tendency is to become more and more paranoid the more that one gleans of this hidden reality um, and paranoid awareness is is a using of that of those um, hidden areas of reality allowing them to usher us gradually into a more complete consciousness of reality and therefore of ourselves so paranoid awareness um, First of all, it's it's a it's a movement from the nuts and bolts view of conspiracies and alien abductions, etc., to a more esoteric or metaphysical view that reality is not what, what it appears to be. But then, even more subtle and even finer, kind of dropping through the narrative would be to begin to see that if that is the case, then all of these discoveries that we're making are actually pointers or clues to our own inner process and our own inner distortions. So it's, it's actually a mirror of our psyche. Whatever we're discovering about the world is, is, is revealing these hidden aspects of our own psyches and our own past. And so then it, it, it's like it starts out getting bigger and bigger and then we reach a point where we realize that there's no end to the conspiracy because it's 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 a cosmic conspiracy and that at that point we either lose the plot and just keep trying to go bigger and bigger or become social activists and try and actually change something which I would say was losing the plot of course David Icke would disagree with me but to me what is more vital or what is what is real is to then reverse the 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 direction as it were and begin moving back inward moving into what is what is fine, what is subtle, and what is very, very personal and mundane, rather than using the conspiracy and the paranoia as a way to avoid the stuff. Just as a spiritual seeker uh, goes deeper and deeper into so-called spiritual truths as a way to get further and further away from the personal muck of their own lives that they wish to transcend, I think the paranoids do the same. They it's it's inverted because they're going into dark stuff and so perhaps they feel that it's more real than the new age la la seeker but it's not really uh, it might be closer to it, 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 it's closer to the collective reality because it is acknowledging the darkness and the disowned material but it can still be a way to uh, distract ourselves from our own inner process which is which is just very simple nuts and bolts as you summed up well not nuts and bolts but you know personal crap that you summed up at the beginning which is that we are mother bonded and that we have these childhood wounds which are relentlessly driving us to do what we do One day I started shrinking, I'm really not sure why. But the sun kept getting bigger as I looked up in the sky. The trees were growing quickly, and as though under a curse, there was nothing I could do to keep from growing in reverse. 
I called my girl and told her to come running right away. I guessed that I'd be visible for only one more day. If she wanted to keep seeing me and playing the love game, she'd have to use a microscope when tomorrow came. I'm just an incredible shrinking man. And it's no small step to do the best I can To amount to any worth In this ever-expanding earth It's one giant leap for the incredible shrinking man I was wretched as a whiner Practically in tears Why had I bothered growing up And living all those years? Why had I exercised And maintained a healthy diet? Why had I grown up tall To have my body just deny it? I'm just an incredible shrinking man And it's no small step to do the best I can To amount to any worth In this ever-expanding earth This one giant leap for the incredible shrinking man The troubles you have given me are numerous I've begun to see though That I owe it all to hubris Just when man begins to think The universe is small He turns around and sees That it's a large world after all I'm just an incredible shrinking man And it's no small step to do The best I can To amount to any worth In this ever-expanding earth It's one giant leap for the incredible shrinking man the paranoid point of view posits that we're not masters of our destiny and that history and society and religion and all forms of belief and language and culture is all the product of controlling forces which are non-human. And that idea to me is... is science fiction to many people, but to me it's a simple reality, albeit metaphoric. I don't necessarily, as when I wrote Matrix Warrior, I don't necessarily believe that that we can translate um, transpersonal ideas or, or realities into, into this frame of reference that we exist in as individuals without distorting them, because then you end up like David Icke with his reptilians and, and petitioning to wake people up to that reality, which is not what I'm about at all, but the, the, the essential idea that we're not masters of our destiny and that we, until we actually acknowledge um, that everything, the very fabric of our existence is a lie, then any attempt to change, we're simply rearranging the elements, the components of that untruth. So that is a way actually to prevent real change from happening because it creates the illusion that we're changing something. Yeah. Well, see, I don't I I don't have a problem with with the notion that reality isn't the way that we're taught and that there are uh aspects to our lives that are uh go remain unknown to us um uh, and that uh that it's important to try to know those things if you're going to attempt to uh, change the structures of society. Um, but I do think it's important to keep in mind that one of the things that you're after when you're seeking self-discovery is uh, the chance to create a better life. And I feel like creating a better life would mean not just personal liberation, but mass liberation, liberation of, of the public, the, the why, most people. Why, why would you want to create a better life? Well, because this one is not satisfactory. Right. So then it's for you that you would be doing it. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. It would be for me. I wouldn't be, it's not a, it's not a complete active altruism at all. 
but mm-hmm. I just happen to believe that creating a situation where the the majority of people are fully creative and act, and active in creating their lives and their future and their history um, would be much better for me. For you personally, but so yeah. but isn't that egomania speaking finally? Uh, it, it, egomania, like I don't believe that I can do it alone. That I can just liberate. No, everybody. I don't. I didn't mean that, but that you're putting your own personal comfort uh, above that of everything else. Uh, you're, you're. Well, I'm not speaking to you personally about it because oh, I don't I, know you. Oh, I understand <laughs> the terms that you're t- speaking in, which are familiar to us all. Mm-hmm. Um, they uh, depend upon a sort of unspoken assumption that our own comfort and well-being is is paramount and that we will seek the truth and we will follow what is true and embrace what is true only so far as it suits us but as soon as the truth begins to undermine or threaten or challenge our own personal comfort then we don't want to know and so the truth that we are just microorganisms within a huge whirling system of conscious energy of galaxies and and stars and planets and multiverses that is a truth that is simply doesn't fit with any personal kind of pursuit of happiness does it because the universe is getting along just fine without us so it, it seems likely to me looking at the situation we're in as a species that all of our attempts to make our own lives or the lives of humanity somehow better has just been a burden on the universe because it's not needed it's not actually required of us and so maybe the reason that we're so uncomfortable and unhappy and constantly in pain is just that is that we're constantly trying to create a pocket for ourselves in in the universe where we'll be safe from reality and well, that doesn't work. That last thing I agree with, the the idea that we're trying to create this uh, illusion to live in, so that we can be safe from the universe. I definitely agree with. Um, I guess I would take issue with the idea that what I'm putting forward as a paramount is my own comfort. I, I I think that that it's not a matter of just discomfort. I'm actually fairly comfortable. Um, I'm just not happy uh, or free. Mm. I feel stymied. But it's not that I feel uncomfortable. Actually living the way that I'm living every day, going to my job and, and, uh, you know, worrying about one paycheck after the next and then reading the news about the economic collapse and the wars and the environment. Um, I'm comfortable with all of that. That makes you uncomfortable. Oh, you're, com- you're I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable. It's yeah. It's easy to to encounter these things as something out there apart from myself. To worry about so a very thought- small part of the world and and not to and and to feel and to feel stymied. It's actually I've been been at it for a while and I feel that it's a fairly comfortable position to be in. It's uncomfortable to try to imagine breaking from that. And and it's and it makes me uncomfortable when I when I feel that that break is going to happen. But it you makes mean on a collective scale. You yeah, mean? on a collective scale, like it, like if I see the the economic collapse is something that really will bring uh, dismantle the uh, the dismantling of our social structure. That you know, uh, eventually there just won't be uh, any order, and that we'll have to create something else that makes me profoundly uncomfortable but mm-hmm. it also makes me ho- hopeful and and i don't know if it's it's a matter of my own personal comfort that's driving me i think to the extent that it that i am driven by my own personal comfort that's to the extent that i i don't believe that that things can change uh it's when i try to but, go ahead. But what else would be driving you i think there's a difference between the desire for to be creative and to to have an active role in life and the desire for comfort. Well, I would agree with that, but being creative and having an active role in life would have nothing to do with social reform. 
It could be. I'm not arguing against social reform any more than I'd argue against painting and painting. I'm arguing against the idea that somehow the universe needs us or anyone uh, to, to bring about social reform. If it's your own path and that's a way for you to interact and be creative, that's very different than being driven by issues. And whenever we're driven by issues, we're not being honest with ourselves because it, our only real issues are with mummy and daddy. If we strip it all away, that's what sweat is about. And I guess it, it may be, it could be said that I'm projecting and that's just my mummy and my daddy, but uh, you know, <laughs> I haven't really come across anyone, anyone who didn't have some sort of wounding in their childhood and that they haven't been uh, imprinted with patterns that we then overlay countless other patterns on until we become adults and we have this very sophisticated latticework of patterns by which we justify any number of activities with these very highfalutin terms whether they're artistic or social or whatever they are but that really come down to those primary wounds which is that area of intense discomfort okay let me see if I can come at you know I agree to an extent but I just think that you know, mommy and daddy didn't arise on their own. They they're they're not primary. They they're part of the overall environment. And yeah, they they definitely the family structure is wounding a lot of people, including myself. But you know, have you ever seen the wall? And with all those uh, children going through uh, the factory and coming out with their masks put over their faces, and and. Uh, I feel like maybe the people who are, are advocating personal self-discovery are just standing on the other side of the factory taking the masks off and finding, you know, somewhat disfigured faces underneath. And, you know, and then saying, well, yes, you're disfigured. Live with it. I'm saying let's, let's shut down that factory. But we're on the inside of the factory. We're, we're the, the thing that's being processed by that factory so what option do we have it, because you're talking about as I see it anyway you're talking about the factory is something that exists not at a physical plane but metaphysically throughout countless generations thousands of years of ancest ancestral wounding um, that goes all the way back to ancient Egypt and beyond uh, and that began when we first started trying to put our hands on the evolutionary process and direct it. And when parents started trying to correct their children and suppressing their own guilt and their own, you know, wounds. And, and, and so that's, that's the astral factory, as I see it, that we're caught in. And I don't see any option of shutting it down because it's, it's there for a reason. It's the only option we have is to fully own up to our part in that process as being, um, well, I'm not sure if I can continue the factory metaphor, but in terms of the ancestral wounds, the, the wound stops with us. And to do that, to stop the wounding with us, which actually would bring about change in some major way for the whole world, but not in the way that we've been talking about, but much subtler. Um, the only way to do that, I think, is to is to fully own. It's like the sins of the fathers. You know, all of the all that has been driving us in this life, all of those wounds, they, they are accumulated wounds. And and so the idea of actually owning up to it in this life and looking at it and letting it take us all the way in is is absolutely terrifying this isn't a small thing I mean, you talk about taking off the mask like it's just anyone can do that almost no one can do that almost no one is able to take off that final mask and so i think if, if just one person does it it has a huge impact on the collective psyche because in a sense all of those wounds throughout the generations become healed by that final owning up it's like something gets assimilated and processed, and so the factory in that person in that in that line that, that it shuts down because they're no longer being driven by those wounds. They're letting themselves be drawn into the wound and go all the way through 
into what is true. But that is absolutely annihilating. That is far more terrifying than the idea of a species extinction or any of these external threats that we think are so important to us, at least in my experience. I guess I can see what you're you're driving at. I, I don't I my part of what I'm doing with um, this podcast and part of the reason why I reach out to people like yourself and Neil Kramer and Richard Grossinger and others is because I feel like um, uh, my perspective, which is is one about uh, the is the perspective of a, of a revolutionary and the perspective of uh, people who want personal revol- revolution, personal. Uh, uh, self-expression um, to, to be the primary focus that there's got to be a, a, a connection here there's got to be a maybe a dialectical process where the, the two opposite the opposite points of view can come together and synthesize and come up with something else because I don't I don't feel like ultimately I'm I'm I want to disagree with you um, uh, you know but I I do feel like there's the I, I do I have this basic reaction to the idea that we should just give up making a change in the world and focus on ourselves as mm. re- you know regressive is not uh, uh, the real answer as well, the wrong that, kind of surrender go ahead yeah well I, I I think there's only one kind of surrender and that's surrendering to what we know and that's different for everyone you know, how we come to that place where we're able to let go of what we think we know and what we want to know and what we like to believe and just be in what we know, which is very small. It's very, there's not much of it. That's why we're constantly looking for more. Um, so, but I think also that the idea of giving up is, is 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 subtler and finer than than you're making it seem and it, I think that it goes beyond revolutionary because giving up to me is 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 giving up on ourselves as individuals it's not giving up on truth it's not giving up on life it's just giving up on 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 this endless delusion that we have that somehow it it's all about us and that we actually matter as individuals, that what we want and what we need and our drives and our dreams and our goals, that they have any meaning or significance whatsoever in the universe, in the greater scheme of things. And I think that that is a true revolutionary act, and that the true revolutionaries like Che Guevara or Gandhi or whoever, they're not necessarily people I admire, but that's certainly, I I respect them, and that this is something that I think um, it was like we were touching on with with, with gurus that um, things can when when a person surrenders in a way that is true, movements actually happen around them, not but not because they try to start movements, simply because they create a pull of truth in their being, because they they are surrendering to what is true, that creates a pull. It's like a vortex, and that creates a movement in and of itself. And the more that an individual is surrendered, the more revolutionary that movement is until we have a truly revolutionary movement, which is evolutionary, not revolutionary. And it's, it's totally um, impersonal, transpersonal. It, it's got nothing to do with personal agendas or goals or social reforms, and yet it would bring about total and final transformation, not only of society, but of reality and even of the laws of nature. Everything would be transformed by an act that revolutionary as us surrendering absolutely to what we know to be true. Hmm. Would there still be people who own everything and uh, other people who work for them after reality has changed? There wouldn't be anything that, that we currently recognize as reality. There would be nothing left at all. Yeah. Okay. So well, that's that. I can see why that's a tougher one than um, just species extinction. Because if you're looking at the abyss total, yeah, that's that's pretty hard. But that's what you're asking people to do. Uh, 
Well, I'm not asking anyone to do it exactly. I mean, people come to Sweda, they're asked, they're required to be honest. That's that's it. They don't have to uh, surrender or reach some sort of agreement with the way that I see things. They simply have to be honest. And if they continue to be honest, then they're either going to go deeper and deeper in or they're going to reach a point where they just can't continue because they see that it is heading for the abyss and then they they leave. So Right. And um, going back to the beginning of our conversation, um, the, Christopher Gray wrote in this book on Rajneesh uh, that that is what he thought the followers of Rajneesh had seen, that, that uh, Osho was leading his... Uh, followers as pupils to the abyss and that they were creating as many opt- obstacles to to that ultimate revelation as they could um, uh, in order to protect people in, who in order to pro- no in order to protect themselves and it wasn't like they were altruistic in this that but the, in order to just resist the the uh, this abyss uh, they, oh, you mean the people uh, who formed around Raj? Yes, yeah, his his followers, his pupils, his the people who were surrounding him and getting him his Rolls Royces. And uh, uh, so, the closer they got to a personal annihilation, the more they had to pull in the other direction by distorting the truth that they were getting sucked into. Right, and basically, the best form of resistance for them was total worship of uh, Raj Nish and. Uh, being his complete acolyte and and you know falling completely under his spell that was their Makes ultimate sense. form because that's like religion in microcosm isn't it if we worship Christ we don't ever have to actually become Christ right and separation yeah yeah but then that can also affect the the guru or the individual himself and in that he he allows that separation and, and and begins to believe his own myth. What do you see in John Deruda that I don't see? Because I <laughs> can yeah. jump in there. What is it about well, him? I, I, I avoided mentioning John because he's already stirring up stuff at Sweater. Like there's a lot of resistance to John, and that's coming out of resistance to, to Sweater and even me personally. And <clears throat> because of that pull, I mean, the pull of truth, of course, is how I see it. How they see it is, is that I've been tricked and for something that's not real and so but I can't speak from that point of view of course I can only speak from my own um, and what what I see in John is truth absolute truth and a, and a more pure form than I've ever seen it before and it's not just seeing it's feeling it's it's actually like a gravitational pull it pulls like every atom in my body to it and um, it's not a worshipful thing, although that I am aware of that tendency in me as it's in everyone to want to worship or look up to an embodiment of something that I'm looking for. What, why do you think that there's so much resistance in Sweda to, to John Deruda? Well, it's exactly what you just said, Doug. Uh, people, when they get too close to the abyss, they will do everything they can to to resist the pull of it and so um, it's, it's been very useful to me because it's let me know that what I see in, in John and what I'm responding to actually isn't that easy to see and so that confirms me in my knowing because I then I know that I'm not just being tricked by words or it's something that I'm actually not aware of how I'm tuning into it if you see what I mean because nobody else and very few other people seem to be able to see it so I'm like well how am I seeing what they're not seeing how are you seeing him do you have you seen his videos or have you met him in person or have you read his I've, books I've met him in person yeah that was what did it I think that if you have met John or anyone who is transmitting a message of transpersonal truth or however you want to describe what that is uh Without actually meeting them in person, you're at a great disadvantage. Uh, it's best not to cast judgment. I, I resisted the urge to cast judgment on John just from hearing his audios because the person who introduced me to him was was trustworthy to me. So I, I said, oh, I'm going to hold my tongue. I'm not going to say anything because I wanted to say quite a lot. I, my eyes were rolling and I really just felt this is not for me. And 
but then when I actually saw him in person, that that, that changed almost instantly. Yeah. So, so yeah, well, having seen just uh, a short YouTube video and and read an interview by with him and and uh, heard a couple of audio files, uh, my reaction to him was, I think, like yours originally. It was well, although I wanted to go uh, uh, the extra distance too, partly because you're interested in him, you know, and I and I've uh, listened to a lot of your podcast and I have respect for you so I was thinking well Jason wouldn't just jump off the cliff for any old fraud here there's got to be something going on that I'm not seeing but he seems to me to have a shtick uh, a, a pretty obvious one uh, as far as seeming enlightened you know a lot of silence a lot of pauses a lot of staring and not a lot of content Absolutely, and it's gone more and more like that because his early takes, he talked like a normal person. They were full of content and no pauses, and those are the ones that I've been listening to recently. And and I, uh, I'm beginning to see now the process of how and why uh, John has become slower and slower and more and more abstract uh, as he goes deeper into what he knows. And so I see very much that it's, it's not a shtick at all. It's something that is actually transforming in John and, and, and why it is, why that is the case. I mean, that would be enough for a whole other podcast, really. Um, but I, I think perhaps for, for those who are skeptical, which is going to be most of the listeners, um, it, it relates to what you said about Rajneesh, and even though it may not be true of Rajneesh, I, I do feel it's true of John, which is that something has naturally formed around him, which is very off-putting, which makes him appear like the classic, untrustworthy guru, Charlton, you know, complete with his two wives and, you know, his his adoring flock and. And, and his long portentous sciences and all the rest of it. And and I don't particularly trust what has formed around John, uh, to be honest. And, th- and that gave me trouble. I thought, well, if he's so enlightened, why would he let something build up around him, which is kind of, not that it's it's not like Rajneesh's thing, but it's still a bit a bit dodgy. But then, I, then it occurred to me that John, uh, if he is what he appears to be or claims to be, then he wouldn't really be... Uh, of this world anyway so it wouldn't really make any difference to a surrendered being uh, any of this stuff so it's kind of a living paradox really the more you try to question it the the more questions you have Whenever a system of ideas is structured with an abstraction at the center, assigning a role or duties to you for its sake, this system is an ideology. An ideology is a system of false consciousness in which you no longer function as a subject in your relation to the world. The various forms of ideology are all structured around different abstractions 
but they all serve the interests of a dominant class by giving you a sense of purpose in your sacrifice, suffering, and submission. She left her basket behind. Religious ideology is the oldest example. The fantastic projection called God is the supreme subject of the cosmos, acting on every human being as his subject. We went to a point where we could see right across the bay. And we smoked our players together as the moon rose. In the scientific and democratic ideologies of bourgeois enterprise, capital investment is the productive subject directing world history, the invisible hand guiding human development. The bourgeoisie had to attack and weaken the power that religious ideology once held. It exposed the mystification of the religious world in its technological investigation, expanding the realm of things and methods out of which it could make a profit. The various brands of Leninism are revolutionary ideologies in which their party is the rightful subject to dictate world history by leading its object, the proletariat, to the goal of replacing the bourgeois apparatus with a Leninist one. The many other forms of the dominant ideologies can be seen daily. The rise of the new religio mysticisms serve the dominant structure of social relations in a roundabout way. They provide a neat form in which the emptiness of daily life may be obscured and, like drugs, make it easier to live with. The sun, intelligent, bright and alive, born of the age we live in. The sun! You know what I tried? What? Pristine. Pristine? Feminine hygiene spray. Oh, that's right. How do you like it? I like it. I use it every morning now. An avant-garde really ideology, you? novelty yeah. in and of itself, and is what's important. In survivalism, like subjectivity yeah, is not? preempted by fear through the invocation of the image of an impending world catastrophe. In accepting ideologies, we accept an inversion of subject and object. Things take on a human power and will, while human beings have their place as things. Ideology is upside-down theory. We further accept the separation between the narrow reality of our daily life and the image of a world totality that's out of our grasp. Ideology offers us only a voyeur's relationship with the totality. In this separation, and this acceptance of sacrifice for the cause, every ideology serves to protect the dominant social order. Authorities whose power depends on separation must deny us our subjectivity in order to survive themselves. Such denial comes in the form of demanding sacrifices for the common good, the national interest, the war effort, and the revolution. It gives you firmness and comfort. It's the perfect combination. You love it. We get rid of the blinkers of ideology by constantly asking ourselves, how do I feel? Am I enjoying myself? How's my life? Am I getting what I want? Why not? What's keeping me from getting what I want? This is having consciousness of the commonplace, awareness of one's everyday routine. That everyday life, real life, exists, is a public secret that gets less secret every day, as the poverty of daily life gets more and more visible. Well, that just about wraps up the 31st episode of the Diet Soap Podcast. You just heard a reading of Larry Law's chapbook from his Spectacular Time series. That was a section um, from the chapbook entitled Revolutionary Self Theory. You also heard Art Tatum's Stormy Weather, which was uh, followed by the Pixies version which was then followed by Chris Isto-White singing The Incredible Shrinking Man. Chris Isto-White, whose work can be heard at the Lumberjack Isto website, that's Lumberjack and then I-S-T-O dot com, was then followed by The Talking Heads, and then finally 
Right now, you are listening to Alistair Hewlett singing the Internationale. I said at the outset that I'd received a couple of emails and, I, and that I'd mentioned them at the end. Uh, but since we're running out of time, I'll just say thanks to Terry I and to somebody going by the initials M.M. Anybody who wants to write to me at Doug Lane, that's L-A-I-N, at dietsoap.org. I do write back, and I want to hear what people are thinking about this podcast. So, Last week I mentioned that you can also call me at the number 971-285-4604. That's 971-285-4604. But it seems that nobody called me last week. Although I'm not really sure that I'm even using the voicemail correctly or how to access it from Skype. So anyhow, leave me a message and let's find out if I can get it to work properly. I want to thank Aeolus Kafis or Jason Horsley for the conversation this week. And I want to direct everyone to his podcast, Warty Theorems, at Kafis, that's K-E-P-H-A-S dot Podomatic dot com. The image up at the site right now, though, for that podcast, might not be work appropriate. So if you're listening to this at work, you might want to wait until you're at home to type in that URL. So, yeah, uh, I guess that just about wraps up this episode. All that's left is my wife Miriam with this week's Titanic Factoid. From The Floating Cemetery, A Conversation Among the Drowned Ones of the Titanic, The Jewish Daily Forward, April 28, 1912. How did those floating corpses die? Who knows? Some probably lived for hours, struggling against the oceanic angel of death until they no longer had the strength to keep their mouths above water. Others probably froze to death. Still, others perhaps fainted out of fright and so were drowned. And as you imagine their helpless death struggles, you realize that all the life belts did was to prolong the agony. Well, it was, in fact, 28 degrees in the water around the Titanic the night that it sank. And uh, 28 degrees is 4 degrees below freezing. Probably everybody knows that. And um, while Many people probably were trapped in the ship when it went down. Many, many people were um, in life belts and kicking around in the water when the ship went down and had not made it into lifeboats. And you really could not survive longer than about 15 minutes most of the time in water that cold. So while not very many people actually drowned most likely, Most of them actually froze to death very quickly. Only a handful of people actually managed to make it from the water onto lifeboats. And a few did survive a little longer than about 15 minutes. I think I've mentioned some of them before. Uh, But 28 degrees is really cold water. (laughs) 